Professor Dave and Chegg here. We now have an understanding of the manner in which electron configurations determine the structure of the periodic table with elements in a particular group sharing the same number of valence electrons. From the table, we can also learn about a number of other trends that dictate the properties and reactivities of the elements. These will be very important to understand as we learn more chemistry. So let's get a look at these now. The first property we will look at has to do with the size of an atom, or the atomic radius. It's difficult to measure the radius of a lone atom, so the convention is to tabulate lists of covalent radii, which are defined as one half the distance between the nuclei of two identical atoms that are bonded to each other. This should be roughly the same as the radius of the atom outside of the context of a chemical bond as well. When we examine various covalent radii, we notice that the radius will increase as we go down the periodic table. Take the list of the halogens. There is a clear increase in radius with each halogen. This is because when we go down a row on the table, we are increasing the end value by one, thus adding a shell and placing the valence electrons farther away from the nucleus. This makes the atom larger, as well as its covalent radius. This trend is without exception. But what about moving horizontally on the table? Generally, as we move to the right along a period, the covalent radius will decrease slightly. This may seem counterintuitive, as the addition of electrons doesn't seem like it should result in a smaller radius. But we must realize that as we move to the right, we are also adding protons, given that the atomic number is increasing. And the more protons there are in the nucleus, the greater the electromagnetic attraction that will pull the electrons in the existing shells a bit closer to the nucleus. There are a few deviations to this trend, particularly if we were to examine the transition elements of a particular period. But in general, atomic radius will decrease as we move through a period. To get a little more technical, any electron in an atom will experience a particular effective nuclear charge, symbolized with a Z. This is the pull exerted by the nucleus on a particular electron of interest. The inner, or core, electrons shield the valence electrons from the pole of the nucleus. So Z effective will be Z, or the number of protons, minus the shielding, or core, electrons. So it's as though each core electron cancels out one proton to tell us the effective charge that is attracting the valence electrons to the nucleus. Valence electrons do not shield as well as core electrons do, which is why Z effective increases as we move to the right along a period, which results in a contraction of the covalent radius. We can therefore say that radius increases going down and left on the table, and decreases going up and right. Next, let's look at ionization energy. This is defined as the energy required to remove the outermost electron from an atom in the gas phase and in its ground state configuration. The higher the ionization energy, the more difficult it is to remove the electron, which tells us something about the atomic radius of the atom as well as the effective nuclear charge felt by the electron. Each element will have a first ionization energy, which is the energy required to generate the 1 plus cation. And they will also have successive ionization energies, like the second ionization energy to go from 1 plus to 2 plus, and so forth. Each ionization energy will be larger than the last, because it will get harder and harder to remove electrons the more positive the ion becomes, as each ionization is a further destabilization. So the electron that is removed will always be the outermost electron. As the atom gets larger, the outermost electron gets farther away from the nucleus and therefore becomes easier to remove. Every time we add a shell, we are moving further away from the nucleus, so ionization energy decreases as we move down the periodic table. Since atomic radius also decreases going to the right within a period, we can expect the ionization energy to increase at the same time. As we go, we are adding protons, contracting the radius, and holding electrons more tightly, so they are harder to remove. That means in general, while atomic radius increases down and left, ionization energy will increase up and right, precisely the opposite of the radius trend. That means helium is the most difficult element to ionize, with a single shell that is totally full and close to the nucleus, while francium is the easiest, with a lone electron in an outermost shell that is very far from the nucleus. 
Looking at this chart, we can see that in general, the ionization energies will increase left to right within a period, like lithium to neon, and then jump back down again for sodium, where the next period begins. There are some slight deviations to this trend, like the way oxygen is lower than nitrogen, and these deviations always have to do with orbital symmetry. Nitrogen's orbital diagram looks like this, while oxygen's looks like this. An atom will be most stable when its orbitals are either half full or completely full, and since nitrogen has its p orbitals half full in the ground state, it won't be as willing to lose an electron as oxygen will, which, once lost, will attain a half full p subshell. There are deviations like this involving half full subshells at various other spots on this diagram. In addition, there is a large jump in successive ionization energies that occur when we have completely lost the valence shell and begin trying to remove an electron from the shell below. So if an atom has two valence electrons, the first two ionization energies will be fairly low, but then the third will be dramatically larger as it involves further ionizing the two plus ion, which has a noble gas electron configuration and thus a full outermost shell which is a very unfavorable process. This is the reason it will require a dramatically larger amount of energy. So we now know that ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom. We also want to learn about electron affinity. This is precisely the reverse concept, the energy change involved with adding an electron to a neutral atom in the gas phase, thus forming a negatively charged ion. This process could absorb energy or release energy depending on the element, and a negative electron affinity will mean that the process is actually favorable for a given element. Let's look at a periodic table with some electron affinities filled in. We can see that the trend is similar to the ionization energy trend, since the harder it is to remove an electron, or the higher the effective nuclear charge, the easier it is to add an electron, and thus a greater electron affinity. This is why elements like fluorine and chlorine have very large electron affinities, as gaining an electron will endow them with noble gas electron configuration, which is a very stable situation. So in general, electron affinity increases going up and right on the table, with some exceptions. Noble gases do not follow this trend, as with a full shell of electrons, it is typically not favorable to add another electron, so we discount them when considering this property. Deviations from the electron affinity trend typically occur for similar reasons of orbital symmetry as we saw in the ionization energy trend. There can also be successive electron affinities just like there are ionization energies, which we measure as we form the 2 minus ion, the 3 minus ion, and so forth. There is one more important periodic trend, and that is electronegativity, but we will save that one for later, as it will make the most sense in the context of the formation of chemical bonds. Professor Dave for Chegg, see you next time.